Hi right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 197, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Richard Garriott, aka Lord British, aka the J.R.R. Tolkien of computer role-playing games. In this part of the interview, we focus in on the later Ultima games, we talk about his love for the Apple II, other Kickstarter projects, indie gaming, and much, much more. Got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Richard Garriott. I know you held on to the Apple II as a platform for quite a while. You must have been really sad when you finally had to move on to, uh, I guess, a DOS machine. I was. And in fact, uh, it was one of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, not only personal disappointments, but also simultaneously was almost one of the most tragic mistakes I made as a company was to stay, stay on the Apple II so long. Uh, you know, when the first IBM PC came out, and, uh, and it really was called the IBM PC. And we now think of PCs as a DOS machine, but you know, at the time it was the company IBM that produced this uh, uh, 10 megahertz uh, 68, or what was it? Uh, uh, I don't even remember what the processor was, 60, uh, uh, whatever it was. But um, um, uh, the, when that first DOS machine came out, and I believe the first uh, IBM PC also had a little chiclet keyboard, a pretty crummy little keyboard. I looked at that and went, you know, it does operate a little faster than the Apple II, but it has so many other warts. There's so many other ways that this machine is not as useful, not as elegant, not as um, you know, correctly designed as the Apple is and how the Apple was evolving. I said, surely the general public is as smart as I am. They will see these same issues and they you know in spite of this pretender to the throne uh the apple is going to remain dominant and of course that completely missed huge market forces that almost immediately came to bear one is the name ibm gives you tons of street cred with people who aren't just the hobbyists who are already big fans of the apple so immediately the ibm pc you know became a bestseller beyond that uh, because of all the people copying the IBM PC and all the clones that came out, which Apple did a pretty good job resisting, um, suddenly there were you know 20 manufacturers of cheap PCs. Well, there was still only uh, Apple, and if you might remember, there was a black machine called a Bell and Howell Apple. There was actually a second one, but uh, 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 but Apple's you know remained rare and a little bit more pricey. And so immediately the death nail was sounded, and I remember very distinctly. Uh, the day when, as a company, we realized we were developing all of our games for the Apple II. Uh, it might have been the 2GS, I think, at the time. But still the Apple II family. Right when it became obvious that those weren't even going to exist as a market. If we, if we could finish the games, but there were, nobody would be there. And so we actually had to start over mid-product and convert the entire company to becoming a PC house when we had no employees who knew the PC. So we had to retrain everybody so every game that was in development took a three-month hiccup in its development life cycle, which financially we had also been completely unprepared for. So it, it literally, it truly nearly put us out of business. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I think that was Ultima 5. I think uh, Ultima 5 might be the only Ultima that shipped on time and on my quality target. And, uh, but let me tell you, man, the motivation was very high because I'd mortgaged my house to make payroll and uh, we had taken on a couple million dollars of personal debt, both my brother and I, in addition to mortgaging our homes. And so it was one of the things where, you know, we're, we're either going to make it or we're going to die trying. It's got a pretty interesting, another interesting uh, question from Ben Leggett here about this. So he wants to know if you think uh, the industry is more or less uh, biased against uh, one or two man development teams. Uh, back when you were making a Calabeth with the Ziploc baggies and everything, uh, than it is today, I guess, with all the indies and opportunities for small teams. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've gone to judge a couple of indie game development hackathon kind of things, and what's interesting is there's clearly some super talented small groups out there that are capable of producing at the highest possible quality levels. Interestingly, a lot of them don't seem to want to compete with uh, uh, non-indie development. Um, but I also think that uh, it, it's rare that I, you know, as, as much as I occasionally see those people at these hackathons, um, I, uh, on the other hand, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked to speak, for example, at South by Southwest is the idea that's coming to my mind. Uh, I remember when the, when the Macintosh was first catching on and Apple 
I mean, and Austin, Texas is still sort of an Apple town. There's you know, a lot of people, especially in the art community, use, use apples. And this was when Macromedia Director was becoming popular to make little kind of point-and-click kind of game things. And, and some of the speakers, these new young upstarts, were getting up to talk about how all these modern tools were going to be the great equalizer and all this digital distribution is going to be the great equalizer and the big companies that dominated the past, that uh, the need to compete with them financially and on distribution is going to be wiped away and we are all going to be judged purely on our individual creativity. And I got up and made a talk immediately after some of these people and said, I think those guys are nuts. And, uh, and I said, the reason why those guys are wrong is because even though every time there's a major upheaval, there is a brief moment of opportunity for a new, less well-funded, less well-organized young gun with a great idea to come to power, there's always a distribution channel. And even if it's like the app store, as soon as the app store is flooded with apps, you've got to figure out a way to stand out, which means you're back into marketing or buying space or doing other things to make yourself to promote yourself. And so each upheaval allows new companies to come to the top, but they have to quickly become big companies or they will not stay at the top. And I will use the, you know, if it happened in every era, it happens. So, you know, Origin was one of the very first companies in the solo player gaming era. We were always in the top 10 of companies because of the high quality product we did, but we were never in the top five. And as distribution began tightened up and places like Walmart said, look, I don't want to talk to 10 game companies. I want to talk to three at the most. So if you weren't in the top three, you couldn't get on the shores, the stores of Walmart, which became the biggest of all retailers of where the games are sold. So you're basically out of business unless you are aligned with one of the top three. And that's why we ultimately became part of Electronic Arts is because we really could not survive independently. Um, but even though we gave EA the first massively multiplayer game, EA did not double down on that and make more. Instead, they ceded that leadership to not only people like Blizzard, but people like NCSoft, who, uh, you know, who became the biggest and remain bigger than EA from an MMO leadership standpoint. And then as the table turned again to, to mobile and social games, it turns out EA didn't move on that one faster, and nor, nor did Blizzard and those guys. And so guess what? We have new top companies like Zynga, who have come to power during this particular era. So every one of these new upheavals, there is an opportunity for a new company company to come to power but already if you wanted to do uh, you know to, to beat Zynga at Zynga's game um, you know they now own those customer relationships and so it's very difficult it's very expensive for you to buy customers in social media campaigns uh, unless you already were one of the first movers and so uh, you know I actually look at kick you know one of the things we were looking at even like this crowdfunding and going directly to customers the when is it too early and when is it too late? Very hard to know. We, we debated this long and hard before we said, you know, first of all, are we ready? And is the customer mood and uh, in the arc of, of doing things in this kind of indie development directly to the customers, where are, where are we in that curve? And I would say I think we're, we're just doing pretty well through it, but I even look at, say, Brian Fargo uh, with uh, the things he's done here over the last couple of days, the new Wasteland and the new Torment. And I actually think he's even a, in a better groove than we are, by all means. And, um, uh, and so uh, uh, there's, you know, I'm hoping to, you know, we're learning a lot from him and we're learning a lot from uh, Chris Roberts with his uh, uh, Star Citizen. Uh, um, and so, uh, uh, so I, think that, I think we're in a good groove of time. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, how long this lasts and whether other you know, bigger, other big companies, or when, you know, you look at people like that, you're going like, Brian Fargo is not small, you know, Chris Roberts is not small, uh, the amount of money they're raising is not small, uh, this is a new way to create a company, or to, to, to be a relevantly scaled company, and, um, uh, but how long it remains the best place for even smaller people, or newer people, harder to know. You know, skipping ahead a little bit, but since you brought up those particular Kickstarters, I was curious if you had, if you were a supporter of those. Oh, I support uh, Chris Roberts and uh, Brian Fargo's. Well, those two in particular, yes, obviously, yeah, obviously, those are my friends, and they're new games I know I already love. But I, but I've, I've supported a ton of other things, everything from uh, little simple children's card games to, and now a, fa a father as of eight months ago, so I, you know, buy some baby stuff. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, and then I buy art that I just think is cool. Like, uh, you know, I bought these, uh, you know, reasonably real life size skulls that are made on 3D printers that an artist will do these cool sculpture things out of. So I buy a lot of art on uh, Kickstarters as well. 
And so, uh, no, I'm a big fan of Kickstarter. I think it's, a, it's the right way to develop your relationship with the audience, which is who you, you know, as I've said before, want to be beholding to. Those are the people you want to listen to uh, when you make your art. Well, back then to the early 80s, and I was wondering if you could confirm the Moby Games has it listed as 1981. Is, uh, when we get the first Ultima, you know, first of all, is that accurate? That is accurate. So um, I often describe Bacalabeth as 1979, but properly it really is 1980. That's actually a mistake I occasionally make. Um, and then Ultima 1 was 1981. Well, I think it's safe to say that uh, Ultima has got to be one of the, if not you know, the most influential computer role-playing game of all time. You know, it introduced so many things it introduced into the, uh, into the industry, tile-based graphics, just, you know, just one of those things. Now, a lot of times I read the story about how you created the game. It kind of stresses how you're a little bit embarrassed about the Calabeth, and you didn't feel like it was really a professional effort. So I'm just uh, wondering, you know, if you can elaborate on that. What did you feel was so amateurish about the Calabeth, and then uh, what did you change? Well, so there are parts of a Calabreth I think were very well done. For example, the 3D wireframe dungeons for the moment in time that that represents, phenomenal. I'm very proud of that. On the other hand, the outdoors were, you can only see a three by, you know, tic-tac-toe grid, a three by three area, um, you know, around yourself uh, was all that was possible to see. And, um, uh, and even that was not very well represented and was very slow to move across. Um, and then... Since I really didn't write the game for publication, I wrote the game for me and my D&D buddies to play on D&D weekends. And uh, so um, uh, there's really no real way to win it. I mean, uh, there's sort of a hack-in way to win it. You know, first go kill two of those and four of those and six of those and ta-da, you win. And but there was no story. There was no character progression. And in fact... The the ninety nine point nine nine percent of the way people died was running out of food. It was basically not possible to stock up enough food to sustain yourself for anything more than super quick dashes out of the castle and into the dungeons to try to you know find the things that it wanted you to hunt. And so it just you know there was I had no QA. There was no testing. Um, you know it was just something I I whipped up. And so as soon as that game sold, I went and said, Wow, you know if I actually knew people were going to use this. I could have. Uh, I just could have done a lot better job, and so uh, uh, that's really what the motivation was to start Ultima, and and the town graphics were a big part of that because we're going like, okay, uh, you know, the dungeons actually work pretty well, but this outdoors is just not that, you know, it's, it doesn't look good. It doesn't make for a. There's no real sense of exploration because you can't see far enough around you to make it relevant. Uh, you're just kind of bumbling around till you find an X on the screen. Um, and so the tile graphics was the, the big innovation that, that, that made it useful. And in fact, it was very much like the paper, the games I would make on, on teletypes. Those would print asterisks for walls, spaces for corridors, dollar signs for treasure, and to where it looked like tile graphics. It just was done with characters. And um, uh, so I had sort of done the precursor of, of tile graphics even in the 70s. Well, the key competition seems to be for the, at least for the earliest Ultima games, were probably the Wizardry and Apshai series. I was wondering if you, I'm, I guess surely you're familiar with them, but you know, what, do you, what do you think of them? Oh, well, at the time, of course, I thought of them as a big deal. They were, they were my number one competitor. And, for example, if you look at the Wizardry stuff, their technology to showcase what a dungeon looked like uh, in many ways was superior to mine by a, a pretty good margin. And there were some interesting detail differences. Like, I made my dungeons, when I would oh, tunnel out a, a corridor, my walls had thickness. I mean, there was, uh, they were basically 10 feet thick. Everything was 10 feet thick. It was either the 10 feet thick area was as zero, which was empty, or the 10 feet thick area was, had one in it, in which case it was solid. So, you know, there was a... Uh, you never had paper-thin walls between hallways. The way Wizardry built theirs is... In any one tile, you could set a flag to the north, south, east, or west as to whether it had the paper-thin wall on it. But then you had to remember on the other side, the, at the wall on the back side of it, or you'd have to be able to see through from one side or the other. But that means you didn't, the walls weren't thick. I mean, they were you know, more or less like they are in a modern house. Um, and, uh, and so there were things about their work that I was studying and debating all the time as to you know, which way should I be working with them or their way or my way, uh, trying to measure those differences. But to me, what made Ultima last in a way that did not for most of my early competitors is most of my early competitors would finish the game and go like, wow, we finally finished the game. We made some money on it. That game was hard to build. 
now what I'm going to do is change the scenario, put in some new monsters, and release a new game in the same game engine. And so the people who bought and enjoyed number two of the series was, generally speaking, a subset of the people who bought and enjoyed the first game in the series. Because the second game was not better, it was just different. And in mine, you know, after a Calabath was going, I could do much better, so I wrote, wrote Ultima 1. After Ultima 1, I said, wow, I'm writing in basic. If I just learned a simile language, I could do a lot better. So Ultima 2 was the first ever assembly language program I wrote and was better than Ultima 1. After I finished Ultima 2, I'm going, well, it was great to have finally written an assembly language. Now I actually know how to write an assembly language. So in Ultima 3, I wrote good code uh, you know, for the assembly language of Ultima 3. And so each Ultima really, by necessity of, of my need to, to improve my skills, really was measurably better than its predecessor. Uh, and that was not the same arc that my competitors were. Some of them started out better than I did, but then kind of began a downward spiral of sales, whereas my constant innovation kept me in a constant spiral, upward spiral of sales. Well, 1982, so we get Ultima 2, Revenge of the Enchantress, and that was the published, of course, by uh, Sierra online, and the first to have a cloth map, you know, if my notes yeah. are correct. But. Yeah, in fact... Uh, that was, ended, that, was, that was why I ended up going to Sierra, was because they would agree to two items. One was the cloth map, and one was a box. And all games prior to that were published like this, a Ziploc bag. And so this was state-of-the-art packaging up until Ultima 2. And, you know, and since I was writing these fantasy games, they already had very big, deep virtual worlds. You know, I, I didn't want mine in a Ziploc bag. I wanted mine to have quality components compared to what everybody else was generating. And um, and even though lots of publishers were interested in publishing my work when I when it announced that I was a free agent, um, Sierra was the only one that would agree to a box and a cloth map, and so I went to Sierra. Did Sierra give you any any grief about the cloth map or try to talk you out of it? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, but uh, but obviously that was that was the num- my my number one reason for selecting a publisher was uh, that these are the things I wanted to include. So um, you know it was uh, there w- there was no um, uh, uh, there was no negotiation on that front. <laughs> well, after that, of course, we get Ultima 3 Exodus, and by that time, you have your own company, uh, Origin Systems. So I was uh, wondering, what were you able to do in that game uh, now that you were free of any uh, publisher influence? Um, well, I would actually say going into Ultima 3, um, the, 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 I don't think I felt unbridled to do anything differently than I had before other than maybe some minor control issues of the box or printed materials. I actually think it was what happened after Ultima 3 that was the real big difference because all my previous games published through other companies also meant that if anybody bothered to write in about those games, it went to those companies and was effectively never forwarded to me. So I have no idea how people played the game or what they thought of them. Once I published Ultima 3, suddenly anybody wrote to the company, which is actually you know, not necessarily a large percentage, but a large number of people, uh, I began to see exactly what people thought of the game. Uh, at least those were inspired to write in. And, uh, and they would often describe how they would play the game. And so I quickly realized people were playing the game completely differently than I thought. People were min-maxing the game for maximum power versus role-playing as the hero. And so uh, it was really eye-opening to go, oh, man, if I actually want to create a game where people are acting like the hero, I better write a game that observes people and makes sure they're acting like the hero. And so that's really what started Ultima 4. If I hadn't, done my, if I hadn't published my own game with Ultima 3, uh, I don't think I would have known or been inspired to write what is, I think, the, really the watershed event of Ultima's, uh, which is Ultima 4. Yeah, I was reading that you were receiving some type of complaints from parents that thought uh, the games were actually uh, inculcating into immoral uh, behavior, and so that's yeah. what led to the well, if to you, the virtues. Back in, back in those times, you know, the game, the tabletop game Dungeons and Dragons, was similar to being you know thought that it was you know there were kids that had committed suicide or something that people were blaming on their playing of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, I had people who would write into Origin. The the, the cover for Ultima Three was uh, you know. It was Demon over a fiery pit, and uh, uh, inspired by the old original Disney animation uh, uh, to that classical music piece, and um, uh, and I had people write in who had seen nothing but the piece of art. They had never played any of my games. They just saw people the piece of art, and you know would call me you know satanic devil worshipper and perverter of America's youth. You know just by just by looking at one picture 
they made this broad determination about what my mission in life was, and um, um, and I even had uh, you know, it's uh, odd that even my own sister-in-law who gave me the Lord of the Rings to read in the first place, which is a huge part of who I am and how I, and what I do. She was very proud that I picked up and read and appreciated the Lord of the Rings, but she didn't anticipate that I would then turn it into you know, interactive computer games. And she's a religiously fundamentalist person. And as soon as I created games about pretending to do magic, she also thinks I'm the devil. And so I've actually, she disassociated herself from me, you know, back in 1980 or so. And we've basically never spoken since. So, yeah, but it's not that uncommon. So to have people who, uh, in my mind, completely misinterpret role playing. Well, you know, like you said, it was such a watershed moment. I, you know, the example, there's just so few examples that I can think of. <laughs> Maybe you're the only one. You know, of a game developer who sets out consciously to try to not just entertain, but try to, you know, leave a player, try to improve, you know, the player's life in, in some way. Do you, do you think you've been successful in that regard? Unquestionably. Uh, and the reason why I say unquestionably is because I have people write me specifically about that issue. Um, and the first really good letter or uh, meaningful letter I received that outlines that exactly um, came from a woman who uh, was writing to me about her daughter. And she said, uh, so this adult woman write, write, writes in and she says, you know, I was looking for a game for my daughter to play. She had, we'd heard about Ultimas. They were good games. I you know, bought the mo most current one, which was Ultima 4. Um, had no anticipation or expectation that this would be of any value, uh, but because I like to watch my and I'm, I'm, I'm a good parent, I want to observe my child and what she plays and what she gets out of it. And she says, I have to tell you that before she played uh, Ultima 4, she had uh, had a real problem with uh, things uh, like kleptomania and other behavioral problems in school that uh, were significant for her as a for, in her mind as a parent. And she said when she watched her daughter start playing my game, she said she manifested those same behaviors, the min-max behaviors of, you know, I'm just going to take advantage of everything I can in order to, get to, make to make an advance. And then she said she also noticed how the game would start reflecting that to her and showing her the results of those behaviors in not uh, patronizing ways, but in logical, rational ways that say, look, you know, if you go steal from somebody, they're not going to help you. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and she said not only did it, was it obvious at that moment about what was happening in the game? But she said it also made a sincere and honest change in her daughter's outlook on life and her behavior in real life. And she just felt compelled to write me and tell me thanks. And uh, still to this day, it's one of the most uh, you know, uh, memorable and important letters of, uh, about my work that I've ever received. Uh, so this question from Rowdy Rob. So what do you think of the Im immorality, or at least alleged immorality, and violence of today's popular games, uh, particularly uh, games like Grand Theft Auto? Sure. Well, so I'm a devout believer that uh, yeah. an artist can build whatever kind of art they want, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. Our beauty is absolutely in the eye of the beholder. And I'm also a big believer that adults are quite capable of selecting entertainment uh, that suits their fancy. And so as an adult, I can look at, say, things like Grand Theft Auto and go, I can see the fun in it. I can, I can enjoy the visceral pleasure and the special effects that go on around it and smile or smirk or laugh or cry based on the, you know, how, uh, you know, beyond, uh, uh, you know, uh, good conduct they can push that. I personally have no problem with it at all. Uh, I even celebrate it in many ways. That being said... I think it's extremely important that people understand that there are, there's art that's suitable for adults and there's art that is not suitable for children. Uh, and, um, uh, and, that, and, and Grand Theft Auto probably falls into the later camp of not suitable for children. But the, but the, and, the, and, and, not, and of course, we have ratings where we try to, this, the industry tries to do a good job of rating its uh, products, but parents still don't do a particularly good job of managing consumption. And, and there's very little we can do on the, ac on the uh, as a creator, there's little we can do on the access side to give parents uh, the tools, uh, but, uh, but I very much support any tools that give parents the ability to manage uh, the content exposure to their children. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Richard. Cool. Uh, thanks so much for uh, doing the interview. Is there any last comments or you know, I, places I, I, people can go to if they want to learn more? I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm very excited to be back uh, kind of building this spiritual successor to my previous work. I really hope uh, 
uh, that people uh, either remember it fondly if they're old enough, and if they're too young, uh, they know people who remember it fondly, uh, and that they'll uh, at least check it out and uh, come uh, consider following us along on this adventure. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a retrospective. And since I'm interviewing Jeff Tonell next, I thought it would uh, behoove me to go through the Dynamics catalog and pick out a, a really good game. Uh, so if you've got any favorite games from the Dynamics library, uh, preferably something that Jeff Tonell worked on, uh, let me know and I'll put it into a hat and pick whichever one pops up. So a lot of great games to choose from there, so I'm really looking forward to that. i just try to do that sooner rather than later since we've only got one week to do it. Uh, also, uh, if you want to donate to Match Hat, support the show, keep these episodes coming, just go to armchairarcade.com, uh, look for the uh, Match Hat link in the top right corner of the page. <laughs> you can tell it's been a couple weeks since I've done one of these. Uh, I think I might have maybe one or two copies left of Honoring the Code, too, if you guys want uh, signed copies. Uh, just let me know. We can uh, work something out. I guess I can always order one myself and uh, send it that way, but it'll take a little longer uh, to reach you. Anyway, what about that Ale of the Week? Ah. Uh, this week I've got something really, really fun. This is the Baby Got Bach, <laughs> Spring Bach, seasonal beer from uh, Wisconsin, the Horny Goat Brewing Company. Uh, really, th these guys have their marketing down, you know. A uh, really great image there on <laughs> the bottle. Never seen anything quite like it. Uh, let's see, looking for any information about the brew. Uh, not seeing anything about the alcohol content or anything like that. Uh, so let's just get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some Baby Got Bach here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I gotta say, it seems very appropriate to be drinking something from the Horny Goat Company in a drinking horn. This should be their uh, recommended beverage container for this. Ah, smells good, it got sort of a chocolatey, a little bit of a hoppy uh, sort of aroma there, not a not real powerful, not really pungent, but uh, it smells good. Appetizing, shall we say? Anyway, let's give this a let's give this a taste. <clears throat> Got a bit of a kick to it. Uh, uh, kind of a uh, chocolatey coffee, a little slight uh, coffee toffee-like uh, flavor here. Um, it's not really powerful tasting. What am I tasting there? There's it's kind of almost like a marshmallow-like uh, taste to it. It's uh, it's quite good actually. Um, like I say, it's got a, a bit of a kick. Um, but the aftertaste is pretty good. Um, it's kind of a complex uh, flavor. We got a lot of different things hitting me all at once here, but I gotta say I'm really uh, partial to this. I, I really like it. I, I think I'm gonna go four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely a fun, a fun beer. And I, I especially like the the whole marketing campaign and the <laughs> the goat on the bottle there. So, uh, Baby Got Bach from the Horny Goat Brewing Company. Uh, definitely one of the uh, best beers I've had from them. So, uh, definitely recommend this. All right, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. So the quotation for this week comes from the great Gary Gygax, one of the creators of the original Dungeons & Dragons game. And it goes something like this. The secret that we should never let any game masters know is that they really don't need any rules. See you guys next week. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble. Oh, shit. Oh.